Good afternoon and good evening, everyone. I'm Judith Erika Magyar, the country representative for Eurocise Japan. I would like to welcome you in our publishing webinar. We are doing this event in cooperation with Taylor and Francis. And uh, I would especially like to thank Victoria Babbitt for agreeing to uh, talk us to talk to us about uh, publishing in journals this evening. She is the director of research and development, um, research and development and outreach, and uh, she joined Taylor and Francis uh, more than a decade ago. She has so far supported societies, editors, and authors as they navigate the rapidly changing publishing landscape. I would also like to welcome uh, Christy Kennedy. She is responsible for marketing at Taylor and Francis, and she will be the moderator during the Q&A session. I would also like to welcome our audience, attendees. I hope you find this session informative and would like to encourage you to submit your questions via the questions panel. Each and every question will be answered in detail. Should we run out of time, please be sure that your question will be answered after the webinar via email. Thank you. And uh, Victoria, if you would like to. Um, start your presentation. Okay, great. Thank you, Judith. And welcome, everyone. Um, thanks for taking the time to join us today. Um, as said, if you have any questions, do type them in the chat box, and I will try and get to all those today. Um, the talk today, obviously, is going to take us through a tour of um, the basics regarding um, the publishing process. So just some of the processes that you can anticipate meeting and best practices around dealing with all the different aspects of the publishing process. And um, I'm just going to turn off my camera during the presentation because my internet has been a bit weak um, this week, so I will turn it back on for the Q&A. Great. So let's begin with looking at the publishing landscape today. So there are about 10,000 publishers today with about 5,000 of those indexed in Scopus. And those publishers are publishing around you know, 33,000 plus English language peer reviewed journals with a further 9,500 plus non-English language peer reviewed journals. And this number traditionally grows each year by about 3.5%. And these journals are publishing over 3 million articles a year, which is just an incredible number to me. But that number traditionally grows by about 3% year on year. However, we are seeing that those growth rates are accelerating in recent years. So we're seeing about a 5% growth year on year of new journals and about a 4% growth year on year um, in terms of articles. And this is due to an increase in research and development spend globally on the parts of governments. And that investment is supporting the work of between seven and actually nine million researchers today, depending on how you define researcher. And what I find interesting is of those researchers, only about 20% publish more than one time. So as you can see, this is a very active landscape, and it's important to think through your research and publishing strategies ahead of time if you would like to make an impact. So before you begin investigating possible journal options, it's essential to spend some time understanding your project and the audience you'd like to reach. Throughout your career, you will likely be involved in many types of research, producing a variety of content. Typically, people are laser focused on the research article, but you may publish review articles, whether that's a literature review or a theory review or a systemic review, position pieces, case studies, book reviews, which are a great way of getting started in publishing. Sometimes your work will be written for specialists in your field, but you may also um, choose to engage in public scholarship, writing for the general public or for policymakers, or just focusing much more on practitioners. 
So take some time to determine your objectives. And when you begin investigating the appropriate place to publish, remember you are joining an ongoing conversation in your field. So make sure you are contributing thoughtfully to that conversation. Your contribution should be novel and should be pushing the discussion forward in some way. Now, there are many different elements to take into account and um, into consideration when you're choosing a journal. And I've listed a few here. So first we have age, you know, obviously a well-established journal is a safe bet. Um, however, that doesn't mean you should ignore new or recently established journals. They may be publishing cutting edge research or using really interesting publishing models. Just make sure you do your research on the journal before you submit. And it can be helpful to look at the history of the journal. Has it published key researchers in your field or some key research? Does it publish on time? Do they have a history of retractions or other problems? Affiliation may be important. Is the journal a journal of an important society or publisher or institution? And scope, you know, is the journal interdisciplinary? Is it publishing only niche research or is it interested in publishing in broad subject matters or possibly a mega journal? All of this information will be clearly outlined in the aims and scope statement of the journal. And you might want to look at who reads the journal. Is it practitioners? Is it a global audience or is it a very local audience? Impact can be measured in a number of ways. So people tend to focus solely on the impact factor in this day and age, but there are a lot of different metrics that you can look at, as well as just taking the time to consider, is this an important journal within my academic community? Um, is it a great source for teaching? There can be a lot of different things that you take into consideration when measuring impact. And the editorial board is really a great place to get an indication of what kind of research the journal is interested in receiving. Editorial boards are built to reflect the ambitions of a journal. So if they are looking to expand into a certain niche area, they will try and find a specialist in that area to bring on board so that they can act as an ambassador for the journal and help run the peer review process for that particular area. And the same is true in terms of geographic reach. If a journal has not received many um, submissions from Japanese authors, but they would like to receive more, they're likely to try and find a board member in Japan that will be able to act as an ambassador for the journal and encourage people to submit. Now, publishing model is becoming increasingly important. And we'll discuss open access in just a, a minute. So I'll just leave that there. Peer review style may be important to you. This information will always be included in the instructions for authors, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. And then some journals will um, publish their rejection rate on the website, um, and this will give you an indication of how competitive the journal is. Um, some journals don't um, publish their rejection rate, but if you look at some of these other characteristics, you probably get a good sense of how competitive a journal is. So some of these characteristics or all of these characteristics might be important to you when you're choosing a journal. Still, it can be challenging at the end of the day to pick a journal, even after taking into consideration all of those characteristics. However, there are some tools out there that can help. So at Taylor and Francis, we have what we call a journal suggester which will match your abstract with potential journals based on their aims and scope statement. So basically what you do is you cut and paste your abstract into the box and then it does a search that provides you with a list of journals that are possible good matches. So obviously you'll need to kind of investigate those journals further, but at least it gives you a list of journals to start with. Our advice is to select a few journals that are a good fit for your current piece of work and create a list, rank them from top to bottom, your number one journal, your number two journal, et cetera, et cetera. And when it's time to submit, start at the top of your list, submit your um, manuscript to the top journal on your list. And if by chance they are not interested in publishing your manuscript, then just move down to your second choice and submit there and so on and so forth until your article is accepted. 
So I mentioned open access um, at the beginning here. And you know, many, if not most of you, will be aware of open access and open research more broadly. So what are the benefits of publishing in an open access journal or platform? The main benefits are greater visibility and with that potentially greater impact both within the research community and the broader public. And the access, visibility and impact can spur innovation. At Taylor & Francis, we have seen that open access articles typically receive substantially more citation. So we see about a 32% increase and greater readership with over six times as many downloads. Increasingly, in many countries, regions and institutions, open access has become a requirement or at least strongly encouraged. But let's take a step back and look at what open access actually entails. There are two basic elements to open access. One is making content freely available in a digital format, irrespective of where you are located. And the second is making content reusable by a third party. And I'll briefly discuss both of these elements. There are many terms thrown around when talking about open access. So you'll hear about gold open access and green open access. You might have heard of bronze or diamond. It seems like there's a new term every day. But today I'm just gonna focus on gold open access. So gold open access essentially entails making the PDF or the version of record freely available online. And there are two ways in which an author can publish open access with Taylor and Francis. So either in a fully open access journal or in what we call a hybrid journal. So for fully open access journals, they publish all of their content in an open access manner. These journals are not funded by subscriptions. So instead they charge what's called an APC or an article publishing charge. However, many societies are funded by, um, many journals are funded by societies or institutional agreements. And in this case, either the author doesn't need to pay an APC or they may pay a heavily reduced fee. All of this information should be clearly presented on the journal website under the instructions for authors. And just a note, oftentimes your funder or your institution will cover the charge. So just do a little bit of research there to see what your options are before submitting. Now the second type, um, the second option for publishing um, gold open access is publishing in a hybrid journal. So hybrid open access is when an author chooses to publish open access in a journal that is subscription funded normally. And much of the content is not freely, um, freely accessible unless you or your institution has a subscription. These journals charge an APC to cover the publication cost of that open access article. However, um, when it comes to hybrid journals, many institutions and consortia have agreements with publishers to cover the APC, APC costs for hybrid journals. So again, just check with your institution to see what your options are. Now, the second element of open access is how your work can be used after publication by others. If you publish open access, you'll be asked to choose a Creative Commons license, which describes how people can use your work in the future. Some journals don't give you a choice on which type of license you can use, so it's important that you investigate prior to submission if you have any concerns. And here are the license. So the first one here is CCBY. And this license allows authors to use your work in any way they choose, as long as they clearly attribute the authorship and the original publication. So they can't claim that it's their own work. And this tends to be the default license for most um, fully open access journals. The next option is a CCBYNC, and the NC stands for non-commercial. So here an author can use your work in any manner, but they cannot profit from it. So for instance, they can't include your article in a book that they will subsequently charge money for. Next, we have CCBYND, and the ND stands for non-derivative. And here an author can't change your work in any way. So they must use it in its original format. 
For instance, this would mean that they couldn't translate your work into another language. And lastly, I've included CCBYSA. And this means that when people use your work, they need to attach the same license that you did originally. And this is also important to be aware of when you're using other people's um, open access work. Now, with the rise of open access, we have seen an emergence of what are often called predatory publishers or predatory journals. And I can imagine that um, for some of you, you've been contacted by these publishers who show enthusiastic interest in your work and ask you to submit to their journal. They often state the peer review, the peer review process is unrealistically short. So they'll talk about days rather than weeks. Um, and then the websites also tend to feature information that's incorrect or perhaps misleading. So they might try and um, create a website that looks like a very famous journal, um, but they'll have some information. Um, maybe they slightly changed the name of the journal. So it'd be just slightly different. Or they may say that they have a global impact factor. Just keep in mind, impact factors are only called impact factors, never anything else. So here are some of the key characteristics of predatory journals. They'll have hidden or unclear author fees. So that's why I said when I was talking about the APCs, you should have all of that information clearly detailed for you in the instructions for authors. It, you should never be surprised by a fee at the end of the process. Um, they tend to lack quality peer review of, of the articles by experts in the field. And they tend to guarantee acceptance and or the promise of very, very fast publication time. So they'll talk about one week or 48 hours. If you want your research read and more importantly, respected by others in your field, locally and or internationally, it's really important to, to avoid publication in these fake journals. En masse, they erode the credibility of all the research that is published in them. However, there are resources out there to help you make sound decisions about where you would like to publish when considering publishing um, open access. For instance, a key resource is Think, Check, Submit. And this is a cross-industry initiative which aims to help researchers make informed choices and to choose trusted journals to publish their research in. So Think, Check, Submit can help you identify high-quality journals which would be appropriate for submitting your research. And it can protect you against fraud and publishing malpractice. However, I would say the best approach at this stage is to seek advice from respected colleagues who have a lot of experience publishing in open access. The next resource is the DOAJ. So this is a database for open access journals. And the journals in this database have been screened to ensure that they are legitimate. However, like many databases, there is an assessment period. So new journals that are legitimate may not be listed immediately. In those cases, you will need to make sure that they are published by a respected publisher. And here is where OWASPA can help. OWASPA is an organization for publishers and service providers working with open access. Members need to meet certain standards to be included in the organization. If the journal you're considering publishing in is not included in the DOAJ and or the publisher is not a member of OWASPA, you should proceed with extreme caution. And again, we're talking about open access journals here. Right, so today we will not be doing a writing workshop, but I do have some simple guidance for you to consider while preparing your manuscript. First of all, think like an editor. Make it easy for them to read and to enjoy your work. Depending on the size of a journal, an editor can receive anywhere from 50 to well over 1,000 manuscripts a year. So make sure yours stands out. Here's some basics to help uh, make your argument easy to read and to understand. Write first and edit later. This will help you to create a through line in your paper. That's the line that holds all the different parts together, the narrative. And remember, simplicity is key, especially when you are dealing with complex problems and theories. So think about your sentence structure and your use of the passive voice. 
I usually advise people to keep their sentences relatively short, if at all possible, just because it makes it a little bit easier to read. The goal is to make it as easy as possible for the reader to understand your argument and the evidence you're providing. And the best way for achieving this is to create a clear and easy to follow structure for your paper. And irrespective of discipline, most academic papers follow this model, the IMRAD model. It's especially important that you create a strong introduction. So that's you know two to three pages um, at the beginning of your paper. Editors and readers often assess the relevance of a paper based on the introduction, as you all well know yourself when you're looking for relevant papers. So it should be well structured and articulate the key elements. An introduction should establish your research question or problem you're exploring, and it should provide a clear thesis or argument which is easy to see and to understand. So make sure your argument stands out. Don't bury it in the midst of the third paragraph there. It should be really prominent. Um, people shouldn't have to dig around for it. And you should also provide an outline of the structure of the paper, letting the reader know what they can expect. So I've written here a roadmap, basically. And of course, the um, structure of a paper usually would follow this model. So you'd have a methods or a theory section. Um, you talk about your results, you'd have a discussion, and then you'd have a conclusion. And of course, different disciplines use different language to talk about these sections, but that's the basic format that you would find in a typical um, research article. Lastly, I'd just like to stress that your role is that of a storyteller. It's up to you to give life to the exciting story of your research. You know, obviously your research has kept you engaged for quite some time. So it's about sharing that passion for the research in the actual article. So be brave and be bold and really try and articulate the importance of what you have been um, researching. Now, once you publish, you of course would like people to be able to find and read your work. And this begins with the basics the first elements of your paper that potential readers will see, which are the title and the abstract. Title styles and format can you know, vary somewhat depending on subject area um, and also um, individual writing style. However, there are some tricks to keep in mind when composing your title. The first is to think about writing the title after you've written your paper. Though if you're like me and have a difficult time coming up with with good titles, it's not a bad idea to have a piece of paper just off to the side where you can jot down ideas as you're writing your paper. Um, you should try and keep your title short and to the point, so about 16 words or fewer. And in the title, you should try and include some essential terms from your paper, some of those key words. Titles should be devoid of jargon and abbreviations because most people are not going to understand the jargon you're using or the abbreviations you're using unless they're very very well known so just be careful to make sure your um, title is accessible to everyone and make sure it captures the subject of your paper and stands out either for its clarity or for its creativity an abstract so why are abstracts important well, abstracts should tell the reader what the article is about. I like to think of them as mini film trailers for your article. It should give a sense of what the story is without providing all of the detail of the article because you want people to click through and actually read the article. And here's some basic tips. First of all, like the title, it's difficult to write a decent abstract before you actually finish the paper as the abstract is an overview of the content. So you do want to wait till the end. And make sure you know the parameters for the particular journal you're submitting to. Most have word counts and some have guidance on format and structure. So do go look at the instructions for authors. And again, think about who your potential audience is and write it for them. You might use slightly different language if you're writing for practitioners as opposed to um, researchers that are deeply embedded in your particular field. And do choose the language carefully. 
Again, like the title, think about keywords and how someone might search for your work. And if your work's interdisciplinary, think about how other disciplines maybe talk about your subject area. They might use slightly different language. Once you've written your abstract, and I encourage you just to do a quick free write, you know, get all the ideas down on paper, and then go through and remove any unnecessary words so that you're just focused on essential information. Um, and during the peer review process, you will likely revise your paper. And if you end up revising your paper after you've written the abstract, make sure to go back and review the abstract and revise it as well. Um, because it's likely that the abstract will no longer reflect that version of the paper. You want to make sure the paper and the abstract do match perfectly. And lastly, make sure to read it out loud and have others read it for fluency. Um, oftentimes people write the abstract quite quickly at the end, um, but it's important that the abstract actually is easy to read because if your abstract is difficult to read, it's unlikely people will click through to the article. So do take time to revise and let other people read it to make sure that it flows well. And lastly, along with the titles and the abstract, authors are often asked to provide keywords that will be included with the metadata for the article. And keywords act as little flags in searches to help readers find your work. So make sure to identify the words and phrases that would be effective in searching for your work. You want to use synonyms as different people might use slightly different words. And again, if you've used some keywords in your title and your abstract, you might think of other words um, to include that would help people find your work. And when using words and phrases, be specific to narrow down the search results. If you use a real general word, you're going to end up with you know, 10,000 search results. Um, so think about using qualifiers, as I've done with the example here. I'm based in Sweden, so if I put homelessness in a search engine, I'm probably going to end up with results for services for the homeless population in Stockholm. But if I frame that with Swedish and policy, I might start getting some white papers, I might start getting lists of NGOs or government agencies, maybe a couple studies, and that sort of thing. So just play around and test your words. Um, you know, put some words in and see what kind of results you get. Is it what you expect? Great. If not, go back and refine them and try and tweak them a little bit. All right, before we discuss the process further, I'd just like to take a moment to highlight some of the ethical issues we see on a regular basis. Issues around publishing ethics are seemingly on the rise, or possibly we're just getting better at identifying breaches. It's hard to say. But here are some of the issues that we see on a regular basis. So we see authorship disputes, competing interests, duplicate submission or publications, data or image fabrication or falsification, plagiarism, text recycling, peer review manipulation, and breaches of copyright. And I'm sorry to say, but this is just a partial list. So it's it really is a problem. Um, we could easily have a full session today on publishing ethics, but I'm just going to focus on three of the most common issues we deal with across disciplines. And that is authorship issues, duplicate submission and publication, and then plagiarism and text recycling. So authorship disputes are quite common and they just tend to slow the peer review and production process down. Because when an issue arises, we just stop everything and ask the authors to resolve the issue before we continue on with the process. And often the issues have to do with disagreements over who is included on the authorship line, or the sequence and names, or who's responsible for different parts of the process. So to avoid any problems, it's extremely important that you have a written agreement between all the authors regarding the responsibilities and the sequence of names on the authorship line and what journal you're submitting to. Um, if you can have that before the process starts, you know, there's, you're, you're going to be able to avoid a lot of problems in the future. Um, as said, if a problem does arise um, between the authors, we do ask them to resolve it. 
If they can't resolve it, we ask them to go to their institution to resolve it, and then to come back to us with a written agreement that all the authors have um, signed and agreed to. So this just, um, again, helps with slowing down the process, with avoiding slowing down the process, that is. Now, apart from standard authorship disputes, there are three distinct issues that we see. And the first is ghost authorship. And this is when a significant contribution to a manuscript has been made by someone without acknowledgement of that contribution. So we don't know they were involved in writing the paper. And this is an issue because we can't know if there was a conflict of interest. The second is guest authorship. And this is when authorship is granted to an individual who doesn't meet the ethical standards of authorship, as we've outlined on this slide. And they're usually included um, because of their seniority or their reputation or their supposed influence in the field. And this is common in some institutions, but anyone on the authorship line should have made a significant contribution to the paper, as they will be held responsible for it in the future. And lastly, we have seen the rise of authorship for sale. And there have been a number of cases where individuals or paper mills offer to add an author's name after the paper has been accepted for publication, but for a price. So they're basically charging for authorship. And these, auth and these actors are preying on the desperation of scholars who are obviously in this day and age under so much pressure to publish more and more articles each year to progress in their careers. So who qualifies as an author? We've listed a number of qualities here, and I just want to stress that it's not or that's linking these different bullet points, it's and. So an author should really embody all of these characteristics, but quite simply, any listed author is a representative of the published paper and should have in-depth knowledge about all aspects of the study as published. So that means the rationale, the methodology, the analysis, and the interpretation. Right, so duplicate submission. This is a rule that many early career researchers are a bit surprised by. The main takeaway here is you may only submit your paper to one journal at a time. So why would it be a problem to submit to more than one journal at a time? Well, when you submit your paper to a journal for peer review, you are committing to publish in that journal and they will use their time and the resources to review your paper and help you improve it. Importantly, you can only publish a paper once. There can only be one version of record. And the fact is, it's pretty easy to detect because oftentimes papers are sent to the same reviewers who then alert the editors and publishers that they're, you know, reviewing the same paper for two different journals. And again, this can often happen because there wasn't a clear agreement on the roles and responsibilities between authors. Hence, two co-authors accidentally submit the paper to two different journals. But I have to say, editors are becoming less forgiving and tend to withdraw papers in question from the peer review um, after checking with the author until they're um, satisfied that it was an honest mistake. So it's just something to avoid. Now, sometimes it is okay to submit work that has been presented elsewhere. You just need to be honest with the editors about previous presentations or publications or postings. Transparency is key in the publishing process. So for instance, if you have published an article in your native language, but would like to publish it in another language, contact the editor of the journal you would like to publish with and ask them if they would be interested in publishing a translation. They may be happy to do so. Similarly, with data presented at conferences, it's not unusual to publish an article that's based on content presented at a conference. It's actually common practice. Again, just make sure to clearly state that the data or an earlier version of the paper was presented at the conference. Now, preprint servers are no longer um, an issue for most um, journals, but again, you need to cite that original posting of your paper and let the editor know that a version of your paper can be found in an archive or a repository and provide the link to it. And then importantly, once your paper is accepted and published, 
go back to that preprint server and attach the link to the final version of record to that preprint version of your paper. Lastly, we have originality issues, which are also becoming easier to detect. Most journals use software to measure instances of overlap with previously published work. Um, and most of you will know that if you use someone else's ideas or processes, data or words, you need to clearly cite them in the paper and provide a full reference to their work. This is true of all content, including websites and blogs, etc. What many are less aware of is the need to cite their own previously published work if you're using those ideas in your current paper, as that will also show up in an originality check. Now, on the flip side of that, we are seeing a rise of text recycling, which is often called salami slicing. And this is when you use the same ideas, data, and or words excessively to the point that it is not offering any new insights or contributing anything new to the literature or the field. Um, and this often happens, somebody has a research project that should lead to maybe two articles, but they try and squeeze four articles out of it. So the third and fourth article really aren't offering anything new. They might have tweaked the data a little bit or came at it at a slightly different angle, but it's not, it's not offering anything new. Anything you publish should be original content, and it should be always pushing the research field forward in some way. Right, okay, so once you're ready to submit, there are a few steps you should take. First of all, it's a really good idea to review what has been published in the journal of your choice. Um, for one, just to make sure that journal is a good fit, but also you might find work that's relevant to your current project. And if you do, make sure to reference that work if it's relevant. Again, you're joining a conversation, so it's important that you do acknowledge what's gone on before you, especially in the journal that you've been, um, that you've chosen to publish in. But again, only if the work is appropriate. You don't want to just cite the journal to get on the good side of the editor. Um, and, and do take time to make sure that your work matches the aims and scope statement of the journal. I've included a little screenshot there in the upper right-hand corner. These statements describe the journal's mission and the type of research they're interested in publishing. And I just have to say, editors spend a good deal of time crafting these statements so that readers and librarians and authors understand exactly what the journal's about. And more important, one of the main reasons manuscripts are rejected is because the research does not fall within the scope of the journal. So you'll find the aims and scope statement on the journal website, usually on the landing page, or there might be a link um, just to the side for the aims and scope statement, but every journal will have one of these. Um, the other uh, resource I wanted to point out is the instructions for authors. And I've mentioned this a couple of times already. And, and basically the instructions for authors are the rule books for the journal. They're gonna provide guidance on formatting of your paper, the types of papers that they accept, word counts, um, you know, how they want the data, um, in, you know, if they want data included, um, they'll have any uh, information on relevant charges, whether that's an APC charge or a submission fee or a page charge, it'll have all the relevant information. So do make sure to look and to follow the instructions for authors before you submit. And just a quick word about language. I often um, get the question about English polishing or language editing. And I've asked a number of editors about this and, and most are happy to look at a paper as long as they can understand the argument and the methods that were used. So the language doesn't need to be picture perfect, but do try and have as many of your colleagues as possible read your paper before you submit. So they should be reading for obviously the strength of your um, paper, but also for the fluency of your argument, the language that you're using. And especially try and have people who have experience in publishing in international journals take a look at your paper, because they'll probably be able to give you some good feedback. 
However, if you do feel that you need language editing before you submit, many publishers like Taylor and Francis do have editing services. So just check the website. Um, there will be information there for you. Now, when you do submit to a journal, more often than not, you'll be submitting to an online submission system, such as Scholar One or Editorial Manager. So to the right here, you can see the landing page for one of our Scholar One sites. And in this example, someone has begun the submission process. And once you have submitted, you'll be able to follow the progress of your manuscript as it moves through peer review. So it's a great resource there. And then I've also included a screenshot of our new submission portal, which most of our open access journals use on the left-hand side of the screen. And this is an intuitive, easy to use submission site, and it's linked to our peer review sites, Scholar One and Editorial Manager. So as you can see here, you're asked to upload files, in this case, either by dragging or uploading the file from your computer. And then once it's uploaded, the files automatically are transferred into the peer review system the journal uses, and then that peer review process begins. So before you begin the submission process, familiarize yourself with the type of uh, submission system the journal uses, and make sure you understand what's required in terms of documents and how they should be formatted. And I'm sorry to say, but there's so many systems out there and you know every publisher has a different system. So really it is worth taking the time to um, check out these systems ahead of time, just so you know what to expect. So here are some basic tips to keep in mind prior to submitting. Um, you know, first of all, as I said, most cases you're going to be submitting online, so make sure you have all the files on hand that you need to submit. And if you're using images and or data that's not yours, make sure that you have obtained permission. That's your responsibility. And then to avoid any mistakes, again, make sure that you have an agreed upon plan with your co-authors on who's responsible for what and which journal you're submitting to. And also, be certain that you have all of their correct information. So you want to have their preferred um, spelling of their name, um, their recent affiliation, um, the most relevant email address, all of that information. And lastly, I know this sounds silly, but um, make sure the version you submit is the final version and not an earlier draft. Um, people often um, submit the wrong version of the paper, and then they wait for peer review to be finished and it's rejected and they realize that they'd submitted the wrong version. Um, and it's a shame. So do take that extra five to 10 minutes to make sure that all your files are the relevant files. We'll now turn to look at what peer review looks like in practice. And there are three types of peer review you're likely to come across. The first is called single blind. And this is when the peer reviewer knows the identity of the author, but the author does not know the identity of the peer reviewer. And this is the most common type of peer review within the STM disciplines. The second type, double-blind peer review, is when all of the identities are hidden. And this is most common within um, arts and humanities and social sciences. And then lastly, we have open peer review, and this is where all of the identities are known, so both the peer reviewer and the author. And what I'll say about open peer review is that there are a lot of different models to open peer review. So if the journal does practice open peer review, make sure that you understand what that entails, because it, it, it might be really open where everyone is able to see the entire peer review process, or it might just be that the peer review uh, the peer reviewer and the author know each other's identity. So again, go to the instructions for authors to make sure that you understand what that entails. And here are the main rules involved in the peer review process. So obviously the editor is the main role and the editor will assess the article to see if it's a good fit for the journal in terms of the content and quality before sending it out to peer review. Um, they then select the peer reviewers who will assess the articles. And then once the editor receives the reports from the peer reviewers, the editor makes the final decision regarding publication based on the recommendations. 
And the peer reviewers, they read and assess the article and any data that's included. So most journals have two to three external reviewers assess a manuscript. And they'll write a short report with suggested additions and changes for the author and provide that recommendation to the editor regarding publication decision. And then lastly, we have journal staff. And these folks tend to be a part of the publishing house. And they are responsible for the systems that are used to run peer review. So they tend to do an initial check of the manuscripts and then um, if everything's okay, they send it to the editor at that point in time. But they also manage communications between authors and editors and peer reviewers. And more importantly, if there are any problems with the system, they're the ones that will likely help you. So if you're having a difficulty uploading a file, you're likely to be in contact with um, the um, journal staff who will help you with um, your files. So as you can see, there are many people involved in the peer review process. And here's just an overview of how peer review works in most cases. So your manuscript is submitted to the journal and it will go through that initial check to see if everything is in order. So if your manuscript isn't formatted correctly or if it's missing files or other components, it will be returned to you with instructions on what to do. And then once the files are in order and um, the admin check is complete, um, the submission will be sent to the editor for a quick review. And that's why I said that introduction is so important because the editor is going to look at so many manuscripts and they really want to get a sense of what your paper is about in the first two to three pages to see if it is relevant. Um, the editor will decide if the paper should be sent out to peer review at that point. And at this stage, it can be rejected if the paper is out of scope or if it's not complete, if it's unreadable or not understandable. And this is called a desk reject. Now, if the paper is of interest, the editor will send it out for peer review, usually to two or more external reviewers who are specialists in the field. They will read the work and provide a report for the editor with recommendations for a decision. And the most common recommendations are revise and resubmit with major revisions or with minor revisions. And just to say, this means that they're interested in their, your work. They like your work, but they have some suggestions on how you can make it even better. Now, the difference between major revisions and minor revisions um, are with major revisions, it could be that they like an idea you're working with or they like your data set. Um, but they still see that you have a lot of work to do. There's still quite a bit of work that you need to do on your paper. Now with minor revisions, that means that the paper's pretty much good to go, but you just have a few small tweaks that you need to do to the paper. So it's not a lot of work, it's just a little bit of work to clean up the manuscript. Your paper obviously can also be rejected at this point. Now I have included except with a star here. It is possible that your paper will be accepted without revisions, but it's highly unlikely. And I usually tell the story of Eugene Fama um, when he won the Nobel Prize for Economics a few years ago. And um, since I'm based in Stockholm, I have the privilege of being able to go to the lectures that the Nobel laureates give on the work that led them to win the Nobel Prize. And I followed along to the econ lectures that year and to be honest with you, I couldn't follow along with much of the um, presentation because I'm not a mathematician. But at one point, um, Eugene Fama was uh, presenting one of the articles based on the research that led him to win the Nobel Prize. And he stood back and goes, huh, you know, I think this is one of the only articles that was ever accepted without revisions in my career. So here's Eugene Fama. I think he must have been in his 70s presenting a paper based on the research that led him to win the Nobel Prize, saying that that was one of the only papers that was accepted without revision. So that's just to say, prepare yourself for revisions. It's the name of the game. Um, every piece of writing can be improved upon, and that's what the peer review process is all about. Now, once you make the revisions, you will resubmit to the editor, who will either accept the paper at that point, or they may send it out again to the reviewers to see if they're happy. 
um, with the revisions you've made or if they have further comments. Now here's the bad news. Your paper can go through this process two to three times and still be rejected. And I'll tell you how to avoid that. So when you're responding to reviewer comments, the first thing piece of advice I have for you is don't become disheartened by the process. Um, especially if you have received um, a revise and resubmit with major revisions, because sometimes that can feel like rejection. Um, so if you are feeling a little bit downtrodden when you receive that, um, uh, when you receive notification, turn off your computer and forget about it for a couple of days. Just walk away, you know, and take a deep breath, make a cup of tea, have a beer, do whatever you need to do to calm down. And then when you're ready to work, maybe one or two days later, open up your computer together to, again and carefully read the letter that came from the editor along with the reports from the reviewers. Because sometimes the editor will um, provide guidance on how to deal with the reviewer comments, especially if there is um, a tension between the two reviewers. Maybe one reviewer has suggested one thing and the other reviewer has suggested the opposite. The editor oftentimes will give you some advice on how to deal with that. And they'll also give you um, clear guidelines on timing, like when you need to return your revisions and that sort of thing. And if you do have co-authors, set up an appointment with your co-authors. Make sure to send them all the materials you've received. And when you have your meeting, go through all the comments that the peer reviewers and editor have made and make a list, essentially make a to-do list. Um, with every single comment. And you might group them into categories if that's easier way to deal with it. And then as you go through the list, make all the suggestions that seem reasonable um, in the paper. Uh, but you might not agree with all the recommendations. And here's the trick for avoiding that fate of going through peer review two to three times and being rejected you need to address every single comment the peer reviewers have made, every recommendation. So where you have agreed with the recommendations, you need to note specifically where you have amended your manuscript. So you can provide page number and detail what the new material is. Um, some journals, it's, you know, you might use track changes just to make it easier for the editor to see where and the peer reviewers to see where you've made changes or you may highlight it but it's also good to have that document where you detail it in writing as well what the changes are that you've made and if you have chosen not to adopt one of the recommendations the peer reviewers have made that's perfectly fine if you feel that what they're suggesting is inappropriate then you just need to say why. So again, on that note to the editor, you need to say they made this recommendation, but we have decided not to um, make that change because of this. So, you know, maybe they wanted you to cite somebody and you don't agree with that because that's not what your project is. So again, just be respectful and just let them know why you're not going to do that so that they understand why you didn't adopt. Um, a suggested change. Now, once you write that letter to the editor with um, noting all the changes that you have and have not made, make sure to kind of review it before you send it, just to make sure that it is super clear that you haven't forgotten anything. You know, make sure to kind of compare it with that list of the reviewer comments to, um, to make sure that you have um, addressed every every single comment that they have made. And also make sure that it is devoid of any frustration or irritation, because this process can be a little bit frustrating. It's hard work writing. Um, the most important thing that I would um, suggest is that, you know, really try and be as respectful and professional during this process as you possibly can be. This is your community. Um, the peer reviewers and the editors are your community. and you know, it's likely that um, some of them might be your future collaborators, or maybe you're going to want to be, become a board member. This is how it starts. This is the beginning of your career and how you start to build that um, robust international um, network. So again, just try and be um, as respectful as you can. And remember, they're trying to help you. They're trying to help you publish your absolute best work. 
Um, I, I tend to think of uh, peer review as a present. It's a gift. It's a painful gift, but it's a gift. Um, and it's important to remember that as, uh, remember it as, as a gift. Right, so the top 10 reasons for rejection. Everyone wants to know this, um, and it will come as no surprise as the top reason is that the manuscript was sent to the wrong journal. So again, remember to carefully read the aims and scope statement um, and look at what's been published in the journal previously, just to make sure that your work actually fits. And for number two, um, that really has to do with understanding what sort of writing project you're undertaking and researching the best platform for your work. And for number three, um, that one is easy. That's about reading the instructions for authors because they will tell you exactly how many words an article should be. So just make sure that you understand what um, kind of rules they have. Now, four through nine, I kind of grouped them together because this really is about sharing your work as much as you can with trusted colleagues. So try and find those people in your network that are really good at giving critical feedback, not the ones that are super nice and are gonna pat you on the back and say, that's great. You wanna find the people with the red pen that are gonna rip your paper to, apart to make it better. So try and find them. And if you're planning on um, publishing in an international journal, um, try and have a native English speaker or someone who publishes a lot in English um, read your paper just for that fluency if you're worried about the language. Um, and the other thing is, if you have the opportunity, I know it's becoming a little bit challenging or maybe less so, I'm not sure with our current condition, but if you have the opportunity, try and present your work at conferences, international conferences, so that you can have people from outside of your bubble hear your work, read your work, um, so you can get a little bit diverse feedback there. And lastly, I, I would encourage you in your own institution to try and create a writing group. So a group that comes together maybe once a month and shares work. Um, we had this at my institution when I was in grad school. It was interdisciplinary in nature, and it was also including people at different stages of their career. So we had, you know, tenured professors that had published zillions of times, and we had PhD students who had never published. And it was really useful, number one, for getting really diverse feedback again on your paper, but also it helps demystify the process to see that everyone struggles with the writing process. Communication is difficult. So it's, I think it's nice to see people who have been quite successful um, with their publishing still struggling, you know, to get a concept, to articulate a concept well, and that sort of thing. So I highly encourage setting up those kind of work groups um, to help you with your writing and also to help you uh, meet timelines too. If you know you're gonna share your work, you're gonna um, spend time writing. Now the last one, obviously avoid at all costs. Um, I think that goes without saying. Right, so what do you do with when your article is accepted? Well, of course you celebrate, um, you've earned it. Uh, while getting published is a great accomplishment, no matter the stage of your career, I think the first time this is especially true. Um, now make sure to keep all the different versions of your paper, especially if you haven't published in an open access journal. So that's the original manuscript you submitted and the accepted version. You can post the original manuscript in an institutional repository after an embargo period. Um, I mean, sorry, the accepted manuscript um, in an institutional repository after an embargo period if you've published in a subscription journal, or you can um, publish that directly on your website. Now, publishers try their best to move manuscripts through the production process as quickly as possible, but you know, a lot depends on you, the author. So be sure to return proofs by the suggested deadline and answer any questions that the production editor has as quickly as possible. And if it is confusing, if any part of the process is confusing, don't hesitate to ask questions. That's what we're here for. Um, so yeah, don't hesitate, don't be shy. <laughs> right, 
Right. So here are some um, simple and effective ways of drawing attention to your work. Um, and really, none of these take more than a couple minutes. So I encourage you to do this. The first is using your email signature. So if you put a link below your um, address information um, with just recent publications and then a link with a line about what that article is about, that's a really useful way of sharing recent publications. Um, because you're likely writing to people that will be interested in what you know what you're publishing and if you have a profile page on your institution's website or a personal web page or sites for any projects you're involved with definitely include a link to your article there um, and the thing to remember is the more links there are to your article from a range of websites the higher it will appear in search engine results so in Google Scholar, if there's a lot of different websites linking to that article, your article is going to end up by being higher in those results. Um, and then also, obviously, if you're on any networking, social networking sites or discussion lists, do make the most of these. So post a sh short message to any listservs that you're a member of, letting them know that you've been published and maybe a short description of, um, of what that um, article is about. And the same on Twitter or Facebook or whatever social media site um, you use. And you could do something as simple as um, this might be of interest to some, you know, recent publication, and just have the link there. Um, you don't have to write a lot. Um, it's just to share. Before I finish today, I'd just like to highlight a couple resources that you can explore on your own. And the first is our How Researchers Change the World podcast and learning program. And here, every episode of How Researchers Change the World podcast features one researcher discussing a piece of research that shaped the way we think today. So they discuss the story behind the research. Um, so, you know, why the topic was so important to investigate, um, how the research was developed, how it's gone on to impact the world we live in, that sort of thing. And then alongside the podcast, we've developed two 12-week learning programs for researchers. One is designed for early career researchers and one for mid-career researchers. So the one for mid-career researchers focuses on impact. So um, yeah, I encourage you to check those out. They're both free resources and the link is there. And then lastly, I just want to highlight our um, author services website. It offers support and guidance and tips on everything from copyright to ethics to choosing a journal um, to how to tweet your research, what to expect during peer review, and lots more. So do take the opportunity to go explore that um, site there. And that's it for me. Um, I've included my email address here in case you have questions in the future, um, but I'm happy to take any questions now. Thank you, Victoria. We uh, don't have any questions at the moment, but I, I do invite you to send them in in the question box. But maybe to, to start, maybe one of the questions we've got in past sessions is um, if we need to publish quickly, is it okay to submit to more than one journal? Maybe you can share a bit no. of that. <laughs> yeah. No, I think I did cover that in the session today. No, it's not. Um, you can only submit to one journal at one time. It's not appropriate to submit to more than one. Um, yeah. Not not a very involved answer. The answer is just no. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's something that we've gotten a few times before. OK. We, we do. We get that question quite a lot. That's why I yeah. say it's, it's something yeah. that's clearly confusing. Exactly. Um, another question is, I think you've, you've talked about the peer review process and how, you know, you should not be um, discouraged when it doesn't go as well as we want it to. So, you know, maybe something about what can we do when, when we receive conflicting advice from peer reviewers? Yeah, I mean, I think many editors are good about reading the peer reviewer reports and then giving some guidance to the author when they send out those peer review reports, but it doesn't always happen. So if you do get two reports and they're absolutely conflicting and you don't know what to do, I would just write back to the editor and say, hey, 
you know, reviewer one said this, reviewer two said this, what would you recommend? Um, and they're usually happy to help. Um, they're there, they're kind of like the third jury member there. Um, but yeah, just go back to the editor and ask. Okay, great. Um, we have one question that came in. Um, in choosing a journal, how do we understand the audience of a journal? Yeah, um, sometimes journals are really clear about who their audience is. Sometimes they'll even have a little bit of note on readership where they will say that. But the other thing that I would say is you probably can get a sense by looking at what's been published previously because the tone of the articles, you know, might be, say, if they're targeting practitioners, it might be much more about practice, um, more case studies and this sort of thing. So it's really about looking at what they published previously and just looking at that aims and scope statement because they often are, as I say, very explicit about who they're trying to reach with the journal. Okay, great. Um, we have another question on um, rejection. I think it's a little long, but I'll just try to paraphrase it. If um, yeah. one paper is rejected from one journal with comments from reviewers, is it um, not wise that we revise that paper and then submit to the same journal again? Well, they'll be very explicit if they want you to um, resubmit. Um, so sometimes you'll get a notification that says reject and resubmit. Um, if you don't get that kind of notification, they're probably not interested in seeing that paper again. That being said, you can always write a note to the editor and say, you know, would you be interested in seeing a version of this after we do significant work? Um, and they may say yes or no. But, you know, if you've gone through the peer review process a couple times and they've rejected with comments, um, they probably are thinking that it's time for you to look to another journal. And that's why I said it's really good to create a list of journals that you would be happy to publish in. So if that first journal rejects you, um, you've gotten a lot of feedback from them, so you can improve the article, and then you can move down to journal number two. Now, if you do publish in a new journal, you need to go look at their instructions for authors and make sure to adapt your paper so it meets any of the requirements they have on maybe reference style or formatting and that sort of thing. But as said, the, the editors are usually really clear about if they want to see another version of your paper. Okay. We have another question on uh, impact. So the, the participant would like to know how to assess the impact of a journal. Um, he's from, she's from law and uh, not really aware of ranking. So how can the impact be measured? Yeah, um, I usually talk about this a little bit more. I must have been rushed, but um, I think that it's really tricky. Every discipline has um, different metrics. So I talk about impact factor because that is the most prevalent, but many disciplines impact factor really isn't relevant. Um, so what I usually suggest to people is look at look to your community. Um, most communities um, will have, maybe they have a list of journals that they think are great, or you look and see who the people you respect, where are they publishing? Um, what journals do they value? It might also be something about your institution. Your institution might say, this is how we measure impact. Um, and that will coincide with journals or with different metrics that you need to take into consideration when you are looking for publishing platforms. But yeah, I think your community is the best place to look for understanding what is valued in terms of journals or platforms to publish in. Okay, the next one is about predatory journals. Is there a way to check the list of, of all these predatory journals? There have been numerous attempts to try and um, create blacklists and whitelists um, for these journals. Um, and it is really difficult because it's a shifting landscape all the time. You know, once we kind of identify a predatory publisher and expose that predatory publisher, they shape shift and change their kind of, um, kind of change their company structure or whatever, and then emerge again um, somewhere else. So um, what I would say is those resources that I um, mentioned, so the DOAJ, that's a great resource for open access publishers. 
Um, they actually have been around for a long time. And a few years ago, they basically flushed the system and started again. And they assessed every single journal that they index there. So all of those journals that are indexed in the DOAJ have gone through um, a rigorous assessment process. Um, and that's why I say sometimes even a, a good new open access journal might not be showing there because it has to go through that assessment process. And if it, that is the case, then it's just important to look at who's publishing that journal. And um, you know that that's why OASPA is a great resource for that because any open access publisher that is serious will be a member of OASPA for the most part. It would be you know it's it's one of the main organizations. But yeah, unfortunately, there isn't like a perfect list of uh, uh, predatory publishers for people to refer to. Okay, the next one is about, so I mean, when you start out as, you know, into, um, would it be more difficult for new authors to get accepted in areas or topics where there are already well-known established authors um, who publish in that area often? No, I think that's the nature of the game. <laughs> you know, I will say that, you know, certain journals are more competitive than, than others. That's just the way it is. Um, but if the research is good, they're going to want to publish it, um, irrespective of where you're at in your career. Sometimes, you know, emergent um, researchers are publishing really cutting edge research that people really do want to publish. So I don't think that that, that is necessarily an issue. It's just, it might be a more rigorous process of trying to get published somewhere. Um, and if the journal is competitive, they're going to have really, really high rejection rates. So if it's you know, if it's got an extremely high impact factor, we have journals that have rejection rates of 95%. So that's just something that you need to take into account. But if it's strong research, there's nothing there's nothing stopping you from uh, publishing in a top journal. All right. The next question is about, I think you already spoke about the peer review process, but um, is there anything else you'd like to add on, um, say you submit to a paper, you submit a paper to a journal, but the peer, peer review process takes very long. Um, what to do in that case? Anything else you'd like yeah, to add? Yeah, a lot of people ask me how long. Yeah, a lot of times people ask me how long peer review takes, and it's a hard answer. But what we can talk about is to first decision. Um, and usually, what we do, and keep in mind, we publish everything from medicine to humanities. So our general advice. Um, is the first decision, an author should receive the first decision, whether that's revise and resubmit or rejection or whatever the case is, within three months. Now, with some fields, that's going to be much quicker. So medicine and some of the sciences, the turnaround is a little bit quicker. But for humanities, three months is, you know, not unusual because that's much more text heavy. The process of an um, assessment takes a little bit longer time. Now, if it is past three months and you haven't heard anything from an editor or you know about your paper, it's not a problem to contact the editor or the publisher and just say, can I get an update? Um, again, be really polite. This is, it's stressful for editors. It's sometimes really difficult to find peer reviewers. And, and even when they are able to find peer reviewers, you know, peer reviewers are really busy. They're teaching, they're doing the research, they're doing their service work and trying to fit peer review in there somewhere. So um, yeah, it can be really difficult, but I, I, I said, it, don't hesitate to contact the editor and just say, can you just give me an update? Because sometimes that helps them. Then they can go back to the peer reviewer and say, hey, I've heard from the author wondering, you know, what the standing is. And then that gives, um, gives them the opportunity to push the peer reviewer a little bit to, you know, speed up the process. Okay, great. The next question is a little long. Uh, it's to do with, I think, the first one that I brought up. Um, is it possible for us to send our manuscript to different journals, but then the difference would be in terms of content? So example listed is you add number of countries, you know, uh, we analyze, but then we send this other manuscript to another journal. Is that is that okay? Is that accepted? Right. So what you're talking about there is probably what we would call salami slicing, maybe. So you're making just the slightest change to an article. 
Um, and and that really is not, um, yeah, that, that, that tends not to be as valued. So what I would say is submit that first article and to one journal and see what the response is. And then if, if that study, if, if the kind of data you have, um, if it's substantial enough to lead to another article, then by all means, write another article. But it, you wouldn't want to just copy and paste the text from the first one and add some new data. It should be a new article. It should be offering something new, a new perspective. Um, that being said, I, I know a lot of times the method sections can be really similar because there's only certain ways you can talk about methods. So that might be really similar in the two articles. But the discussion, all of that should be new. It should be um, novel. I hope that answered that. <laughs> okay, thanks, Victoria. Um, we don't have any other questions at the moment. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Well, as I said, my email address is there. Area. I'm yeah. happy to take. Sorry, I think we talked over each other. I was going to say my email address is there, and you're, you're so welcome to contact me um, if you have mm -hmm. any questions after the fact. Yep, I'm just checking again to see if any more came in. Um, none at the moment, but I think it's it's covered quite a wide area, so it's pretty pretty good for the session. Okay, okay. Well, thank you, everyone. It was nice to be here today, or virtually at least. <laughs> thank you very much, Victoria and Christy. That was very informative, and we have learned a lot uh, from the webinar. Uh, I would like to encourage the EuroSAS uh, Japan community to submit their queries to either Telegram Francis or to us at japan at eurosas.net. Thank you very much again. Much appreciated. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Stay safe. Bye. Bye.